Hello, welcome to the House of Wellness. Always a great pleasure to be here alongside the full team. Hello to Joe Stanley, to Jackie Felgate, Dr Nick Carr. Good to be with you again, as always. Hi, it does. It is gorgeous to be out in nature again. We do love it, of course, because a big part of our own personal wellness journey is caring for the health of our beautiful planet as well. It certainly is, Joe. It is, of course, what sustains us. And you know how all good gardeners talk to their plants? Did you know that plants can talk back. <laughs> well, just like cats meow and dogs woof and bark to get attention. I'm sure Dennis does that to you. Big dog. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> well, it turns out that plants are sometimes literally screaming out for love. But they're too high-pitched, they're little voices, they're too high-pitched for us to actually hear them and they increase when plants are stressed. But now scientists have found a way for us to hear them. Take a listen to this. Now, that is a really, really unusual noise. Mm. Just, you hear, like, a bit of a popping sound there, Joe. It's amazing. It's like the, you know the bubble wrap when something's yeah. wrapped in? It, well, you're not far off yeah. the mark, Dust, because uh, that popping sound you can hear is actually the plants releasing these tiny little bubbles when they're under duress, and that's the popping that you hear. And scientists found that their voices were actually louder when they were dehydrated or when they had their stems cut. So it makes you feel a bit guilty oh. about <laughs> buying that bunch of flowers. I feel really sad. About that. <laughs> well, here's another thing that actually has broken my heart a little bit because non-stick fry pans, which is one of my favourite kitchen yes. utensils, are the latest thing to wreak environmental havoc. Apparently, the coating is virtually indestructible. It makes you worry a little bit about the amount of food we've eaten off those non-stick yes. fry pans for a start, Joe. but I think there is a little bit of good news. Uh, there's a chance scientists have found a way to get those uh, toxic chemicals to decompose, and they've been around since the 1940s, so that seems like a good thing. Oh, my God, can you imagine the first time you saw a non-stick fry pan? <laughs> Give it like, to me. This is the best thing I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> for your fried rice, your scrambled eggs. I love it. <laughs> well, I'm actually with you, Joe, because I love my non-stick pans, but it turns out that the non-stick substances called PFAS are actually potentially not good for our health and the environment. So the sooner we can get them decomposting or decomposing, the better. Well, decomposting and decomposing are both buzzwords that we're all familiar with and we all have our own ways of dealing with waste in our home. But with millions of tonnes of food waste being tossed into landfill every year, what would it be like to have a composter in your own home turning food into fertiliser? Helen, what is the percentage of, in a city like Melbourne of people who live in high-rises? Well, the majority of residents actually in, in CBDs, whether it be Melbourne or Sydney, actually live in, in high-rise apartment buildings. Um, in the city of Melbourne, it's 80% of residents live in high-rise, and I would say that that would be similar to most cities around, not just in Australia, but around the world. So then how much food waste from these sorts of apartment blocks ends up in landfill? Well, right now, that's 2.5 million tonnes of food waste that we're producing a year, which equates to about four kilograms per person per, or household per week. That's an astounding amount of waste, which is why Helen Steele from Eco Guardians was so keen to be part of a radical new plan to reduce landfill. Back in the day, you know, so many households would have had compost years ago and they would have had their chook bin and... But, you know, our, our lifestyles have changed. We're, we're looking for convenience, speed, ease, um, particularly when we're talking about living in, a, in an urban or, or a city context. Residents in six high-rise buildings in inner-city Melbourne are tossing their waste into a dehydrator that heats, shreds and reduces the volume of the food scraps by 85%. The unit itself, it heats the food waste to about 100 and 102 degrees, so it's kind of cooking it slowly for eight to 10 hours. And what that does is, is breaks the material down, it removes all the moisture. There's a paddle in there that also shreds the material. And because it's being heated at, you know, at that temperature for such a long time, it actually pasteurizes and, and makes it safe for handling. And, and it removes any pathogens as well. So if somebody would happen to ingest it, um, it it's, a, it's a safe product, including dogs that might happen to ingest it. They probably will get very thirsty, uh, but, but it's safe for them as well. 
There are some contaminants that do end up in the output. Plastics and packaging, the compostable bags that we all think break down, they, well, they don't break down very effectively, so we remove those. And very often, particularly in a residential apartment building, we often get cutlery <laughs> that goes through the system or Tupperware containers. So, so we remove that and then we bag that up and we bring it back to the residence. It's awesome to know that, you know, we're saving a few kilos a week of scraps going to landfill, to all the bits that the kids don't eat, like all the crusts and all the vegetable peelings and the scraps from dinner and stuff like that. And it's awesome because it teaches the kids about composting, like they learn about it in school, but now they get to, you know, actually do it at home. It's a win-win for resident Louisa, who drops her scraps into the dehydrator every few days, knowing that it will also turn their family waste into fertiliser. Helen, show me what it looks like, this product that you produce. Um, it's a very lovely kind of coffee granulated uh, product, but you know, currently, you know, this is actually only available to those who are using the system. And what we're trying to do is, because we're also conscious that um, a little bit goes a long way, and we're in the process of, you know, collecting the material that can't be used on beautiful gardens, refining that ourselves, and we're hopeful that we can have, you know, soil food in supermarkets and garden care centres really soon. The trial has been running for five months across 70 apartments and in that time has processed more than a tonne of food waste that equates to planting 32 new trees. So do you want to sprinkle some of that, just one spoon all around there? And have you found that the residents really buy into this program? Yeah, you know, that's, I think, one of the most exciting things about this particular program is the body corporate here is, has been exceptionally proactive. They reached out to the City of Melbourne and they wanted to participate in, in this program. Um, so they're yeah, hugely enthusiastic and love the story that they can tell that, you know, their food waste can actually be used on, on the garden. In fact, it's, it's used on the garden in which we're sitting in right now. And what a beautiful garden. They're doing some incredible work here yeah, for their are. green spaces. And, 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 and not only for the green space itself, but, you know, they've got a, a community vegetable garden. So they're putting the soil food on that and, and it's producing beautiful you know, fruits and vegetables for them. Well, I absolutely love it. And as I said, I really don't like composting. So how long till I can have a little mini unit in my home? Well, we'll, we'll keep you posted on that. Um, and maybe you could join the trial and participate oh, in put that. put me down. <laughs> yes, I would love that. And then finally my family would say, stop whinging about the amount of food waste. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a nice story to tell, isn't it? From you know, garden to fork and back to garden. I love the idea of a circular solution. So food scraps become fertiliser, goes on the garden, which grows food. It's amazing. And it's a great story, Joe, and I love that there seems to be a new innovation in how we better deal with waste every day, and that is a really positive thing. And in more positive news, there's a global coalition of countries working on a legally binding agreement to end plastic pollution by 2040, which is fantastic. And just on that, Australia has tripled the size of the Southern Ocean Marine Park. It's located halfway between Antarctica and here. It's now the size of, get this, Germany. And it's, of course, a haven for seals, for penguins and for some amazing bird life. And, Jack, it's also home to this magnificent and seldom seen wonder. Now, there were some tourists in a submersible deep in the waters of Antarctica and they got a rare sighting of this. Wait for it. It was a giant 30-foot jellyfish. Oh. <laughs> it's only, ever, it's <laughs> only ever been seen 120 times before. It's incredible. Wow. It is amazing what bubbles up from Ooh. under the water, including a not-so-humble cup of coffee. Here is Heinze. Melbourne is renowned for not only having perhaps the best coffee in Australia, but the world. Is that hard to live up to? Well, definitely. I mean, we sort of were part of that movement that was happening and certainly not responsible for it, but rode the wave of specialty coffee becoming really popular. That was 10 years ago. Here we are 10 years later. It's, it's the coffee capital of the world, or one of them at least. As co-founder of one of Melbourne's most renowned roasteries and cafes, Trevor Simmons takes his coffee pretty seriously. But one of the most popular items on the industry beans menu was inspired by an old childhood favourite. Bubble tea's been around, I, I think, since the 80s. I was first introduced to it when we were young and we were growing up uh, over in Asia. We saw sort of bubble tea coming out. So when I came back to Melbourne, we drank, I drank a lot of bubble tea. I was getting, like, apple iced coffees, I was getting the milk blends. And I was like, this is great. 
And then I forgot about that. You know, sort of five years later, we were sort of sitting around and we were going, you know what we need to do is create another beverage. You know, we really want to get coffee into more drinks. And I think I said, you know what I really love is bubble tea. Let's create a, like an iced coffee bubble tea. And one of our baristas was like, no, no, let's just do a coffee, a specialty coffee bubble cup. And I was like, okay, let's give that a go. And it took us a few goes. The first one was absolutely disgusting. Uh, and then we just sort of reiterated like the recipe and, and workshopped it. And here we are. Can I please have an original bubble coffee? Yeah, sure. Okay, so I want you to run me through what goes into a coffee bubble cup. Yeah, so I mean, we take the original recipe for a bubble cup, which is tapioca pearls, usually a milk and then a flavoured syrup. So we're like, okay, so what would what would be the coffee version? A, a pure coffee extract, so that's just coffee extracted down like cold brew tapioca balls. Now we soak them in cold brew as well, so you got this double hit of coffee coming through. We add a condensed soy milk to give it a little bit of thickness, and that basically gives you the, the, the basis of a, an original bubble cup. And then we do different flavours based on that. Run me through the different varieties you've got here. Uh, well, we've taken different influences and we now do in seasonal flavours as well. But the really popular ones have been like salted caramel, which, I mean, that sounds hectic, but it's pretty awesome. Uh, pandan, which is like, you know, Thai vanilla sort of flavours, which has been really interesting. Uh, and then we're looking at different, different releases with different sort of um, berries and uh, different sort of uh, summer fruits that are coming through there as well. Is it Instagrammable? Very Instagrammable. People literally walk in, come in, take a photo. I hope they drink it, but I hope they definitely take a photo of it, yeah. <laughs> Here's the original bubble coffee. That looks Thank so good. Thank, Thank you. you. Here we go. Melbournians, they are known to be coffee snobs. Mm. Do you think your take on the bubble tea loosens things up a little bit and doesn't take things too seriously? Yeah, uh, 100%. I think being able to take coffee and make it more fun and accessible kind of just breaks through that barrier of snobbery. I mean, we've never really played into that. At the end of the day, most people want to drink the coffee they want to drink. And if you can do something really interesting and engaging, more people will gravitate towards that, as opposed to offering the most rare single origin from the high mountains of Ethiopia. So I think this has been a bigger winner. We definitely sell more of this than we do of the, uh, some of the single origins, yeah. Oh, wow. That is such a great texture and consistency. And I just got one of the tapioca pearls, <laughs> and they kind of explode in your mouth. A really good, strong coffee flavour. I'm, I'm into it. I love it. Tell me, Jack, mm. have you tried the traditional bubble tea? Look, I don't know about traditional, but my kids are obsessed with bubble tea. And when they order it, I have no idea what they're talking about, like half sugar, full sugar, these pearls, apple, peach. It's very yeah. sweet. Um, but it's so popular. It's so popular. There's one on the street corner near where we mm. live and my daughter has banned me from going because that's where the teenagers <laughs> come on. She's it's like, cool. Mom, no. <laughs> I don't mind the matcha. I like the matcha tea. I don't mind a matcha latte. Quite I don't a, mind a quite matcha ice matcha. cream. Oh, we're mad for matcha. Delicious. <laughs> the green stuff, right? Yeah. But we are sticking with the food theme. We're going to take a look up next at the fabulous world of fungi and how it's becoming a superfood. The magical world of mushrooms is coming up. Hey Joe, we started today with the incredible story of turning food waste into compost in some of Melbourne's high-rise buildings. Love that story. And now a Ukrainian startup called S Lab have created packaging entirely out of hemp and mushrooms. And when you're done with it, you throw it in the compost, it breaks down in 30 days. And it's brilliant. It's a lot like polystyrene, except it's 100% biodegradable. I mean, how much do you love mushrooms? Like, they are just the go-to on everything. Of course, it's the packaging, but we've got mushroom tea, mushroom coffee, and now it's the hot topic for mental health. Jo, another trend is mushroom stacking or shroom stacking, where you combine medicinal mushrooms with complementary botanicals to supercharge the benefits of mushrooms. Well, I know that Gwyneth Paltrow was mad for it, so it must be good. Well, that's good enough for me, then. You Gwyneth like Gwyneth, I'm sure. Big tip for me. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, autumn is the time of year when mushrooms are popping up everywhere, and who better to give us a masterclass on the intriguing fungi than exotic mushroom farmer Jason Crosby? Whenever someone says to me, oh, I hate mushrooms or I don't like mushrooms, I always think, no, you don't like button mushrooms. Like, you probably haven't tried all the other varieties that, that, that are available out there. I'm Jason Crosby, and I'm the mushroom man. <laughs> 
Jason Crosby is a fungus enthusiast who turned his fascination for fungi into a thriving business. In 2016, Jason left his job in IT to pursue his passion and started farming exotic mushrooms from his specially built grow shed just outside of Ballarat in Victoria. I always had in the back of my mind that it's something that I'd love to do as a job. I wasn't happy in my career at the time, so I thought I was just gonna do a bit of a Hail Mary and, and try it and see how it goes and yeah, it just went from there. Now, every week, Jason harvests around 80 kilograms of exotic mushrooms, supplying restaurants and food stores around the state. His temperature-controlled grow rooms mean he can cultivate year-round. Basically, it all starts with uh, this little plate here, which is the actual mushroom culture grown out on a nutrient dish. So you can see the mycelium on top of the plate there. So basically what we do is take a little wedge from that agar plate and we put it into a jar of grain spawn, which is just um, oats, hydrated oats. And then the mushroom will colonise the oats, like it's doing there. And then once that's fully colonised, we then break that up and pour some into the, the sterilised substrate. And then those bags will come into incubation and they'll slowly consume the substrate, which you can see happening there. There are around 14,000 species of mushrooms worldwide, and around 3,000 of these are edible. We're kind of limited in Australia to what we're allowed to grow because of um, biosecurity laws and stuff like that. I think we grow about eight to 10 different varieties here. From blue oysters, yellow oysters, lion's mane and king browns, each variety has its own unique flavour and texture. These are king brown mushrooms, so great for making steaks or scallops. Um, they have a really meaty texture and really juicy and tender. So these are yellow oyster mushrooms, um, so they're beautiful yellow colour, great all-rounder, good for pastas, risottos, that sort of thing. Here we have the lion's mane mushroom, so uh, this is good for also pressing into steaks. You can make vegan crab cakes out of them, they have like a seafoody sort of texture um, and they have medicinal properties as well, really good for your brain. Really? And they're delicious, so that's a bonus. <laughs> if you cut a, a cross section, they actually look like a cross section of a brain, which is bizarre. <laughs> When Jason started six years ago, there were just a handful of exotic mushroom farms. Now there's over 80 operating nationwide. During lockdown, many mushroom enthusiasts started growing their own or foraging for wild mushrooms. But not all mushrooms are edible, and some can be deadly. This is an Amanita muscaria mushroom, um, also known as fly agaric. It looks like a fairy tale mushroom, basically and it is actually poisonous, so I tend to stay away from this one. Like there are mushrooms like the pine mushroom or slippery jack or something like that that are pretty easy to distinguish, but besides that, I probably wouldn't trust my ID skills. Jason's message is clear. Picking wild mushrooms, even for an expert, can be dangerous and, in some cases, fatal. People just really need to be careful about what they're picking, know what they're looking for, buy a field guide, have someone experienced with you who knows what they're looking for, and even then, just still be yeah, really careful. The good news is that responsibly sourced mushrooms are packed full of nutrition and carry a swag of health benefits that are only just being discovered. I think mushrooms have the potential to, to fix a lot of the problems that we face in the world. I'm just fascinated by them, like the biology, the ecology of mushrooms, like the diversity of species, the uses, like I think we're learning more and more now about um, medicinal benefits of mushrooms. Yeah, it is a very fascinating world and I know I love it and I think other people will be fascinated by it as well. Dr Nick, who knew there were over 3,000 varieties of mushrooms? We've got me. lots of facts on this show, but what's your favourite? Uh, any mushroom that's cooked in a lot of butter for me, but as long as someone else has picked it. Yeah, I don't think I'd have the guts to go into the wild. I clearly don't look like someone who goes into the wild and pick my own mushroom. <laughs> yeah, and there is actually a spike in hospital admissions from mushroom poisoning at this time of year. So best to take Jason's advice and leave the foraging to the experts. Also at this time of year, it's World Immunisation Week, so it's a timely reminder for everyone to go get their flu shot. Yeah, I had mine just before Easter. You, Jack? You put me on notice. I will get that done this week. <laughs> and remember that COVID vaccine is also free now for those five and over. And if you're 65 and above or you've got a chronic health condition, it's really important that if you haven't had COVID infection or a vaccine in the last six months to get an update now. Up next, we're going to take a look at car safety and in particular, keeping your children safe in the car. That's up next.
trends are constantly changing. It's like fashion, they can be over plucked and thin like they were in the 90s and then they can be really full and quite heavy. However, just because it's on trend doesn't mean it's going to suit you. So long faces, you have more room to play with your eyebrows. If your forehead is quite small and narrow, I wouldn't be going with big bushy brows. For me, I can't have really big fluffy brows. They just make me look quite masculine and don't necessarily complement my face. What's in fashion now is more of a straight brow and something that elongates. These tails to your brows are very important. If you're pushing them down, you're going to close off your eye. As you age, it's important to lift them and create more space. So if you were to brush the brow in a downwards motion and you kind of get that old school brow shape, what it does is you can see, if you just move to this side, it really closes the gap between the eye and the brow. As Soon as you brush up, you're left with an instant lift and it's super flattering to Say's face, her eyes, and just a little rule of thumb is to start the brow where the tear duct and the inner nose is, and then to get some kind of shape between the iris and the end of the eye. And then finally, if you want to know how long your brows should be, hold a pencil, on a diagonal line between your nose to the back of your head and you can see right here, this is where it should finish. So your length is perfect. So I haven't extended the length. All we're doing here is just hair-like strokes and just extending the colour, not necessarily the brow because it is really full. Now, anywhere here where you've got a little bit of a bald spot, no hair is growing, just go in with a pencil. Once you start to go back and forth, very heavy, you're going to get block-like brows. So stick with little movements like this to create that little soft shadow. Three products I would invest in for eyebrows. You probably have one already, it's tweezers. Keep them on at hand, control yourself, and just grab a couple in between appointments. Secondly, a brow mascara that you can pop in the brow first and at the end to keep the brow in place and see what you have to work with. If you've got really overplucked brows, you really need to go in with either a brow pencil or brow powder and just create that beautiful shape. Things people do wrong with eyebrows is overplucking choosing the right colour. So a lot of people will go in with the same colour as the roots of their hair. A little tip from a professional is go two shades lighter because when you apply it to the hair, you're going to get that darkness. My advice on eyebrows is the same as my approach on beauty. Have fun with it. Your brows are there to complement your makeup. Don't let them overtake everything. And above all, they're not identically the same. Start small, start at home, start in your bathroom, and you'll start to see that this manicure of your brow and this care will actually elevate and change your makeup look. Thanks to Jade Kay there. You know what, I tell you what raises my eyebrows is seeing what some drivers get up to behind the wheel. And Joe, the research now on how dangerous it is for all of us to be distracted by our phones in the car is seriously scary. And you think of your email pinging or people glancing at their phone or checking social media when they drive. And alarmingly, it's the younger drivers who seem to be most at risk. And actually does uh, food and drink vie for the top spot um, because up to 50% of Australian drivers admit to dining while driving. <laughs> Some other interesting ones include doing your makeup, dozing off, or even changing your clothes. Okay, mm. I am going to admit that I have done the old lipstick oh, yeah. behind the yes, wheel. Same. But I, I tell you, the worst thing I saw was I saw a guy make a full pot of noodles. <laughs> At the line, it's like he had his bowl, he mm. put his noodles in, then he pulls out a thermos and he's doing this. And then he had chopsticks. I was like, seriously, dude, do yeah. it at home. But, I still think the thing that gets me the most is when you had the four in the back seat and they're fighting and yeah. they're carrying, and you sort of can't help but <laughs> glance over the shoulder, trying mm. to tell them to calm down. Mm. I've done that a bit over the journey. But, and it's even worse stars actually if they're not properly restrained because in Australia car crashes are actually the leading cause of death in kids under the age of 15. Now, that is a really alarming stat isn't it? Uh, the kids under 15 the most dangerous thing they can do is get in the car and we know that the rules change as kids get older for how they need to be restrained in the car. To tell us more here's Dr Warwick T. So the number one cause that brings children to be severely injured and brought to this hospital 
uh, is that they're involved in a car crash. And once a child is in a car crash, the number one factor that's going to determine whether and how badly they are injured is how the child is restrained. We've learned by asking parents from families all over Australia that there's a lot of misunderstanding around. Almost all car seats, and particularly those that are sold in Australia, complying with Australian standards, will have a shoulder marker to guide anyone fitting that child into the car seat to say, does the child fit in this car seat? There are so many parts of childhood in which we celebrate moving on to the next stage and to do so as quickly as possible. But this is not one of those moments. This is a moment to stay safest the longest by keeping our children in the restraint as long as they fit, as long as their size is compatible with the size markers and the ability to adjust that car seat. Eventually there is coming the time that a child will be big enough that they are so big they can no longer fit in a car seat with a multi-point harness and that child is now going to be going into a booster seat. In times past, the booster seat was just a small cushion which elevated the child. Nowadays, the cushions are not recommended, but it is the much larger seats, options that are still called a booster seat, but they offer some head protection and some lateral movement protection, a safer option for our children. And now is the time that we do utilise the adult lap sash seat belt that comes with the car. Now, really importantly, your child is not going to be safe to travel without that booster seat until their size and their fit starts to approximate that of an adult. Because it was an adult that our lap sash seat belts were designed to protect. In real terms, that is going to be a size in the order of 145 centimetres. And your average Australian child will reach 145 centimetres at 11, maybe 10 for the taller ones, we see half of Australian children aged between seven and 12 traveling in the front seat of the car. I understand the attractions of that. You feel a bit more grown up. You get to control the radio perhaps. But the cost of those meaningless benefits are that we double the risk of serious injury in the event of a crash. And for some people, we're going to have to take children who are now no longer using a booster seat and encourage them back into the booster seat. That's a challenge for the family dynamic. But it is also the safest thing we can do should today be the day that we're going to have a car crash. Hospitals see far too many kids injured or even worse every year in car accidents. And having the right restraint, and remember they must be fitted by the kids' size, not age, absolutely crucial. I think also having really clear guidelines as well, because I remember mm. not being sure at what age my daughter Willow could sit in the front seat. And I think parents want to do the right thing, they just need the help to do so. I always remember that moment coming from home from the hospital and the first time you clip the capsule into the car and you're driving <laughs> yeah. at like 1k an hour thinking this is just so overwhelming, protect so my precious. child. <laughs> you never forget that first no, drive home. So there. Nervous. I remember the first time I put the oldest one in the pram on one of those cobblestone streets and I was so convinced <laughs> that his head was shot. I carried the pram <laughs> for like a couple of k's like the down the street. It was unbelievable. <laughs> hey, up next on the House of Wellness, we're on the nose a little bit, uh, Dr Nick. We're going to have a look at the science of sneezing. Yes, coming up in a minute, I've got the achoos covered. The days are getting cooler, the leaves are changing colour and the spring pollen is a distant memory. Now autumn normally means a reprieve for allergy sufferers, so why is it that some of us are still suffering symptoms? So what are allergies? So allergies are basically nothing but an uh, overreaction by the immune system of your body when it is coming in contact with something called as an allergen when somebody inhales it in, or when it comes in contact with the skin, it starts to show up symptoms of allergies, being runny nose, itchy throat, itchy watery eyes, and intense itching of skin. All of these allergic reactions are caused by a biochemical called as histamine, which is then released into your body. And how common are allergies in Australia? Oh, around 20% of Australian population actually suffers from allergy. But that's not the alarming fact. The fact is 35% of this population is actually not treating uh, their allergies enough. Why is that? Well, ignorance or not understanding what the trigger is fully 
But typically, pollen, pollen grains, essentially, are a, a big trigger when we see outside. But pets and the pet dander that comes, which is indoors, they are also a major factor for triggering allergies. Oh, no, please don't say that we've got to get rid of our cats and dogs. You know, they're part of the family. But why is it that pets are triggering out-of-season allergies? The typical animal dander or their hair or saliva, which ultimately they are harmless, but people who having allergies show up an over immune response. What happens is that histamine uh, then latches on to the cells and they start to manifest these symptoms. But worry not, because there is um, something called as antihistamines. So these are a group of drugs which latches on to the cell and then they mitigate the response. Oh, that is such a relief. So if I take the right medication, it means I can have my beautiful ruby in my life. Phew. Telfast 60 milligram tablets provide fast, non-drowsy, 12-hour relief of the symptoms of hay fever and pet allergies. Out of the five senses, Jack, I think the one I drive the most amount of pleasure from has to be a sense of smell. And for me, especially when it's around food. Mm, what's your favourite smell? Well, I think one that gets me in all the time is my weakness. That's that smell of hot chips. <laughs> it's not House of Wellness approved. But mine is probably a newborn baby smell, a beautiful new baby. Yeah, that is up. a beautiful thing. And we mm. do underestimate what our sense of smell does for our health, for our well-being, our enjoyment of life. And for those who've lost their sense of smell, yeah. there may well be a breakthrough. That's right. Researchers in the US have developed a so-called bionic nose, which would kind of work like a cochlear implant and send signals to the brain to give the wearer the sense of smell. And that is enormous, as we said, for those in the past. There has been nothing that you can do when you've lost your sense of smell. I guess the caveat on this is it is some distance away, but hopefully it will all work out and finally provide a sense of smell for those who have missed out. Well, someone who gives great hope to everyone that he sees is our own Dr Nick Carr. And up next, he talks us through the science of sneezing. If I say to you the word achoo, you'll probably know I'm talking about a sneeze. <laughs> Achoo is a lovely word, and it's a great example of what we call onomatopoeia, a word that sounds like what it represents. The a uh is the short intake of breath, before the chew, the explosion of air through the nose and mouth that's the sneeze itself. We sneeze because something irritates the delicate lining of our nose, anything from dust to infection, allergies, and even bright light. We'll come back to that. And it really works. A good sneeze can expel droplets up to two metres or even more, which is why it's so important to cover your nose and mouth when you sneeze. A sneeze is so forceful because there are a lot of muscles involved. The abdominals, diaphragm, chest and throat. This is why it's better not to try and hold a sneeze in, because although it's very rare, if you do go the high pressure risks damaging the eardrums or even the delicate blood vessels in the eyes. Not good. No, much better just to let that sneeze out. Oh, and when you do, doesn't it feel great? That's because a proper, wholehearted sneeze releases some of those feel-good chemicals called endorphins. So go ahead, sneeze away. Make the most of it. As part of the sneeze reflex, we close our eyes. <laughs> Scientists don't really know why, but it may be to stop some of that gunk that we expel from our noses getting into our eyes. And contrary to myth, it is possible for some people to keep their eyes open when they sneeze. And also contrary to myth, no, your eyeballs will not pop out of their sockets if you try it. Promise. And in case you've heard otherwise, no, your heart does not stop when you have a sneeze. That's a promise too. Curiously, about a third of us sneeze in response to bright light. Now, scientists still don't really know why, but it seems to be some crossover between the reflexes in the eyes and the nose. And it tends to run in families, <laughs> and it goes by a wonderful medical name. Autosomal dominant, compelling helioophthalmic outburst syndrome, <laughs> for which the acronym is ACHU. Gesundheit. The environment in which we live in is becoming more complex and disconnected, and this leads to feelings of stress for many people. Ginseng is a traditional herb that's been used for thousands of years to help people with stress. Korean and Siberian ginseng are used in traditional Chinese medicine, and they're used as restorative tonics. 
They have adaptogenic properties, which means that they actually help the body cope with stress and the stress response. They also support the functioning of the nervous system. Siberian ginseng has the additional benefits that help with our emotional well-being and mental functions, such as concentration and memory. American ginseng is a little different. Originating in traditional Native American medicine, it is known as a rejuvenating tonic. It enhances energy levels and physical stamina. It also acts as an aphrodisiac, helping support a healthy libido and healthy sexual function. And finally, American ginseng also helps the immune system fight off illness. Luckily, you don't have to buy a round-the-world ticket to experience the benefits of ginseng. You can find them in the form of Australian-made supplements. We all feel irritated, fatigued and just generally over it and we can't be expected to deal with everything on our own. So just like we lean on other people for support, we can also lean on Mother Nature for support. So Jack, we have spoken a bit on the show about how much water we actually do need to consume and do we constantly need to be rehydrating? Well, he's the font of all knowledge on the House of Wellness, isn't he, Dr Nick? And he's given us the definitive answer. And no, we don't, because we get our hydration from other things, like, say, our food or a cup of tea. But what I have noticed is the popularity of those giant drink bottles. You know the two-litre ones that everyone seems to be carting around nowadays? Well, you know, they hit the big time during COVID when a content creator on TikTok saw a supermodel carrying one and she said it totally changed her life. Oh. And so now <laughs> the emotional support water bottle hashtag has had 64 million oh. views. Uh, I mean, that is ridiculous. I think we've all got too much time on our hands, <laughs> don't we? But psychologists say that it's almost like a modern day security blanket. But I tell you what, they don't come cheap. There's a Prana one out there. It's 600 mils and it's over $300. Oh my I think that'd go down well with our husbands. Yes, absolutely. But the good thing is, of course, Jack, it does reduce the amount of single use plastic, yes. which we are all here for, as is Lou Kynes. He's very passionate about it. And here he is with Zoe, where they're all about strengthening our bones. If you have ever come off second best to the monkey bars as a kid, Zoe, then you'll know the importance of looking after your bones. Loki, I'll take your word for it, but bones really are important. They provide the shape and support within the body. They protect our organs and they're the storage site for blood cells and minerals. And aside from staying away from dangerous outdoor play equipment, an easy way to look after our bone health is to turn to the essential fat-soluble vitamin K. Now, there's two varieties of these vitamins in our diet. Vitamin K1, which you can find in green vegetables like our hero today, broccoli. Love broccoli, massive fan. It is so rich in nutrients and really versatile too. You can have it in pretty much anything. I'm making mine into a slaw today and I see you're doing pasta. That's awesome. Agreed, but back to the case. There's also vitamin K2, which appears in fermented foods and animal products. Vitamin K2 is essential for achieving peak bone mass, promoting bone integrity and strength. Better absorbed than its counterpart, vitamin K1, research suggests it helps to reduce the risk of bone fractures from conditions like osteoporosis, found later in life. And vitamin K2 also helps support our blood health by helping our blood clot. Now, I know that sounds like a bad thing, but it helps prevent excessive bleeding. And in addition to foods, we can also find vitamin K2 in supplement form. Well, all that's left to say is bon appetit, Zoe. Oh, I really like that. That's a good one. And hang on, <laughs> hang on. You don't like my jokes. What's going on here? It is good, that one, though. That one is actually good. I'll take it. I'll take it. Get Nourished is brought to you by Go Healthy's Go K2, a convenient one-a-day formulation to help support strong, healthy bones. Tell you what, I really enjoyed our story today on decomposing food waste in the home. I think it's a really positive thing that we can all do in a meaningful way. Now, I keep hearing this term, nutrigenomics. It means absolutely nothing to me. I'm looking at you, <laughs> Dr Nick. What's that all about? Well, it's all about how food and our diet interacts with our genes. And a perfect example comes from the wonderful world of the bee. Now, it turns out that worker bees and the queen bee are actually genetically identical, and the difference is diet. 
So the workers feast on honey and nectar, and they're short-lived and they're infertile. Whereas the queen feasts on this royal jelly and she turns into this really plump, long-lived breeding machine. It's all about diet. It certainly is, Dr Nick, but I'm going to pivot to a rather weird topic now. We've all heard of the seed bank in Norway, help, which helps preserve the world's plant diversity. Well, now scientists have actually come up with a human poo bank. Yes, I get the best topic. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a bank in Switzerland and it stores over 3,000 samples of human stool. That's poo to mm. you, and because they want to keep the microbiome, all those healthy bugs that we have, for future research. What do you put on your business card if you run <laughs> that uh, bank? Uh, <laughs> don't like talking about it, does. <laughs> <laughs> but the idea, I guess, is to collect samples from all around the world to help combat diseases of the future. Yeah, and staying optimistic about the future is one way to stay well. Always optimistic after a day on the House of Wellness. <laughs> yes. So thank you yes. again to the, uh, the team. That's all we've got time for today. Tune in to myself and Gerald Quigley on House of Wellness Radio every Sunday. Thank Thanks as always to our great friends at Chemist Warehouse. We'll see you next time.